Ephesians chapter four, we started through this passage in an earlier session and we didn't finish it. And I think it's worthwhile to go back and look at it for a moment. It's a letter written to the church in Ephesus. You remember the backstory on the church in Ephesus? Paul spent a good deal of time there. It, it says that while he was there, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Healings and deliverance, that even claws that he would pray for would be taken to people and they would be healed and delivered. And there was a, a consistent enough expression of deliverance in the lives of the people from unclean spirits, unholy spirits, demonic spirits, that the, the sons of the, the Jewish rabbi tried it and it didn't turn out so well for them. And the, the, the demonized person gave seven brothers a beating and stripped them naked so that they ran through the streets that way. And it caused the fear of God to come on the whole region, it says. And they brought the things they had used to practice the occult and burned them in a public bonfire. And it gives us a valuation. It was several million dollars in today's economy. So a remarkable moving of the Spirit of God in Ephesus, followed by a very demonically inspired riot that engulfed the whole city. So the, the believers in Ephesus had seen the power of God and the response of ungodliness. They had, they had seen quite a bit of spiritual activity. And now Paul is writing to them. And, and they seem to be a bit addled. They're, they're a bit confused. And in Ephesians 4 and 17, he said, I tell you this, I insist on it in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. If he's telling them that, you can deduce something. There's a conclusion that I believe is appropriate. If he's saying that to them, there is something that has caused him to imagine that too many of them are living as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And he uses very strong language. He said, I insist you stop it. They're born again. They're spirit filled. They believe in miracles. They believe in deliverance. And he's saying, your thinking is messed up. And he gets into the weeds with them. He said, this is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, so he's reminding them of something. They have, they have digressed, they have strayed, they've wandered off. He said, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. It's been corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. To put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, this is what you were taught. And then he begins to give them a very detailed list of, of how they have, their thinking has, has drifted. Do you, do you have room to imagine that as Christ followers, born again, spirit-filled, church-attending, chorus-singing Christ followers, we could get goofy thoughts? See, we've been so insolent. We wanted to argue that we can't lose our salvation or whatever. And, and we, we completely forget about what it means to live a godly and upright lives. That's the assignment. In chapter five, he said, follow God's example as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loves us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Now you gotta balance verse two and verse three. We all know we're gonna walk in the way of love. We're gonna love everybody. Group hug, kumbaya. We're just gonna practice love. <laughs> We've all heard it ad nauseum. Well, I started to say something, but I wasn't sure I, it was gonna be in love. But in verse three, he said, listen, there can't even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity nor a hint of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking. They're out of place. Practice thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. 
Now remember, this is right in this passage. It starts out with walk in the way of love. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Church, we are called to lead holy and upright lives. Are we perfect? Nope. We're cracked pots. And God is working on us and through us. But there's a difference in recognizing that you are in the process of being transformed and yielding to the practices of this world. Do you understand the difference? In one, we capitulate and we excuse it. Well, nobody's perfect. We all have our struggles. That's just the way I am. Well, my people, well, you don't understand the pressure that I'm under. I mean, we have an amazing ability to provide for ourselves justification for ungodliness. And so Paul is writing to a church that he has labored in in seeing birthed and, and grow up. And he said, there doesn't even need to be a hint of immorality amongst you. And he goes on to say, please don't misunderstand. No immoral person has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And you can say in the context of this, no matter what building they sit in on Sunday morning. So I think we need to come back to being the church before we have the courage, before we'll find the authority to raise our hand and stand for godliness and righteousness. We're going to have to start to bring it into our own lives and to our own kitchen tables, and to our own family circles, and to our friends groups. We've got to be the church. We have lost our way. We're not the first church to do that. We're not the first generation to do that. It doesn't mean it's the end of the age because we've done that. It may very well be the end of the age. But the the challenges that we're facing inwardly are not the result of the end of the age. They're the result of our own choices in the language of James to walk in the dark. We have loved the darkness. We have lusted after it. It bugs me when I see us present ourselves in the same way as the world when we bring our music forward. I want excellence in what we do and how we do it, but we should be distinguishable from the people who aren't godly. We're not gonna mock their behavior when we present what we do. Our aspirations for ourselves and our children should be different than than the aspirations we see for the ungodly. We should have aspirations that are dramatically different, not the same except they say Jesus once in a while. We have loved the darkness. We've looked at it with hearts filled with envy and covetousness and desire. We've got to be willing to be different. Because it's better. God's not taking something away from us. The end of the darkness is destruction every time. It's not a better way. They are lying to you. And you know it's true because all of us have walked those paths far enough to know that the promise was empty. The temptation was ill. The temptation was real. In the moment, there's something you'll want. But beyond the moment, it is destructive. It's as if we're addled. We've been dazed. We're in a stupor. The language is plain. Put off the old self. Be made new in the attitude of your mind. Put on a new self. Put off falsehood. Speak the truth. Stop stealing, he said. It's an invitation to a total makeover. 
You see, a faithful church is a transformed church. It isn't just a church who's embraced a creed or a new moral code. Our faith doesn't begin on the outside. It's not an outside-in process. It's an inside-out process. We begin to be transformed on the inside. Our desires are changing. If our desires aren't changing, you have reason to, to reflect upon the quality or the nature of the relationship you have with the Lord. There should be in us a trend toward we want less and less of ungodliness. When we start, we want a lot of it. We start to sort that out and to rearrange and to, to redirect. But we should want less and less ungodliness. There's a transformation underway. I brought you three passages that, that highlight it. We could do it in a, in a much broader way, but... I want to do it quickly because I want to close with the passage from Chronicles. But Romans chapter 12 says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Uh, in view of God's mercy, again, we would be tempted to say, in view of the mercy of God, just do whatever you want to. He's merciful. But Paul wrote and he said, in view of God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now, we're not familiar with the sacrificial system. We haven't practiced that. But you take an animal to the priest and then the priest would slaughter the animal and put the dead carcass on the altar as a part of a burnt offering to God. By the time the animal was placed on the altar, it was empty of any self-determination. Nothing jumped off the altar. And Paul is using that imagery and saying to you and to me, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What's it mean to worship the Lord? It means to offer yourself physically, which means when my body says, I want, or I feel, or I think, I say, hush, I'm going to worship the Lord. I don't want to. I didn't ask for a vote. We're going to go worship the Lord. I don't feel like it. Shut up. We're going to go worship the Lord. I don't like the music. I know, and they don't like the way you sing, but we're going to go worship the Lord. <laughs> the next verse gives us the how-to. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. To conform is to adapt to. Don't adapt to the pattern of this world, but be transformed to be transformed is to be changed in potential. Don't adapt to the prevailing standards of this world, but be changed in potential by the renewing of your mind. We're going to have to learn to think. It's what Paul was telling the Ephesian church. We're going to have to change how we think. We think too much like the ungodly people. Their values are our values. Their entertainment is our entertainment. Their goals are our goals. We, put, we fill our children with it. And then we wonder what happens to them. We want to blame the schools or the teacher or somebody. We have to change how we think. So transformation begins with our mind and our thoughts. But then it extends. Look at 2 Corinthians 3. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. It's a, it's a different perspective of transformation. It says we are being transformed. It's the continuing present tense. It's not a completed fact. It wasn't something that happened at a point in time and was absolutely accomplished and therefore resides as something fully. The, the language is very capable of expressing that thought. That's not what's being communicated. It says we are being transformed. It's describing a spiritual freedom that comes to us and continues in us. We are being set free. We are being transformed. I hope I have more freedom in my life with the Lord today than I had a year ago. And I certainly hope I have more than I had a decade ago because I am being transformed. But you have to desire that. You have to be interested in that. You have to cultivate that. It won't be forced upon you. The Holy Spirit does not dominate. He'll put before you an invitation, but you'll have to choose to cooperate with him. You have to choose to cooperate with transformation. 
Again, we've had this really destructive idea that there's some minimal kind of Christianity that you can embrace, but you don't have to go any further with it. That's just for those hyper people. Folks, the, the Bible makes no such distinction. There's not like hyper Christians. There's just God's people. And you either are or you aren't. This notion that there's, you know, this middle lane is a fabrication. It frightens me. And then in Philippians, it describes for us a completely different kind of transformation. Just our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies. Remember, transform is to change in potential. Our bodies will be changed in potential so that they'll be like his glorious body. Do you know you're going to get a new, you're going to get a physical makeover? Amen. If you're young enough that that doesn't matter to you, just hang on. <laughs> In this case, it's future tense. It's tense. It's something that's ahead, which will be accomplished. Our current physical self serves some very important purposes. It's a daily reminder that there is a God. It says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't say we are fearfully and wonderfully evolved. That de defies logic to me. Something as amazing, as an intricate as the human immune system, all of the layers, the ways that you are protected from things that would d diminish or destroy your well-being. The, the human body, you are designed to heal. I'm always a bit amused at Christians that don't believe we should pray for healing. God built you to heal. If you drop your phone and the screen breaks, if you go put it in a dark place and put a little water on it, it'll heal. Not. You've got to get a new screen or a new phone. You cut your finger, that little rascal will heal. Nobody goes, oh my God, I've lost my finger. No, it's a paper cut, buckwheat. It'll get better. <laughs> I mean, we're built to heal. It's the most remarkable thing. If you'll just stop doing destructive things, your body will get better. So our body reminds us that there is a God. It's like a flashing neon sight sign. It also reminds us of our temporary status because you're born with a termination date. You're on a countdown clock. And if you turn the calendar enough times, that will begin to break through. And you're like, wow, I should think about something beyond now. So your body has a very important function, but the promise of scripture is there is a, there's an update coming, a complete transformation. So the, the encouragement is to take care of your current assignment, take care of the temple, but don't worship the temple. Amen. Understand it's a container. We talk about it as an earth suit. And, and we struggle with that. We end up worshiping the container. We think it's the container that gives us value and the container that makes us significant. And God said, no, you're going to get a whole new one, a glorious upgrade. So we're invited to transformation of our thoughts, of our spirit, and of our body. It's a total makeover. How are you doing with that? There should be a consistent dynamic of change in our lives. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill, hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.